Folks, if you're not in the class of 1973, you probably don't remember this. Uh, it's about 50 years, and I haven't done it in a long time, so give me some grace. But here's what would happen if uh, Chancellor Hurd was here today. Ladies and gentlemen, parents, students, and distinguished guests of Vanderbilt University, <laughs> it is a great honor and privilege to have you here today. I am, of course, especially fond of the class of 1973, who was our centennial class, and here we are uh, uh, 50 years later. And as the chancellor, I welcome you. I ask you uh, for your attendance and patience with this group up here, this panel discussion. And um, I'd be, let's see, 107 years old if I was here today. <laughs> And I wish you safe travels on your way home, and thank you for your support of Vanderbilt University. Thank you, Jim. And so begins the class of 73 talent show. <laughs> so I think we have a song and dance number coming up next. Um, my name is Andrew Marinus. Uh, I am not a member of your class, although I am uh, celebrating the 50th anniversary of my graduation from preschool. So uh, I'm excited to be with you. No, <laughs> figured some tomatoes would be thrown at me. I'm glad it's breakfast. Um, I had a very interesting experience where a member of your class came up to me, actually yesterday, uh, David, and let me know that he used to date my mother-in-law. Um, she's <laughs> so things could have turned out, there he is. Uh, things could have turned out very differently for me and my family. Um, I <laughs> uh, hope you have had a great weekend and enjoyed your extra hour of sleep with all the partying that's been going on uh, this weekend. But could we please have a round of applause for the staff that has put this weekend together? That <laughs> They've done uh, an incredible job as always. Uh, I arrived on campus 15 years after you graduated in the fall of 1988, and I was thinking that there were still some figures on campus that would have been familiar to you that, that I got to know during uh, my time here, people like Casey Potter, uh, my English professor Walter Sullivan, uh, my philosophy professor John Locks. Um, I spent a lot of time in the athletic department, so uh, if there's any athletes in here, you knew Jewel Warden, the trainer, and Richard Baker, uh, a gentleman that was in athletics for probably 50 years. Um, and I did have a chance to meet, uh, this is Connie Hurd, who I'll introduce later, uh, Connie's father, the chancellor. I came to college on the Fred Russell Grantland Rice Sports Writing Scholarship. And so uh, every semester, Mr. Russell would take us to the lunch at the university club, the, the recipients of the scholarship. And he would walk us past different tables, and I always remember he would say, uh, look over there, there's Branscombe and Hurd. And I only knew those as the names of buildings, and I didn't really realize that they were people too, you know, and so that was the uh, first chance that I had a chance to meet your father. And then as I was working on a book, um, the, a member of the class of 1970, Perry Wallace, I had a chance to really uh, learn so much more about your dad and the incredible influence that he had on this university and really opening up this university uh, to allow it to become uh, the great international institution that it is today, uh, including opening the school up to black students, but also students from the north or Catholic students, Jewish students, women, you know, so many ways that this university changed while your dad was, was chancellor, um, necessary changes. And so I wanted to do a quick reset for those of you who maybe haven't thought about the chancellor for 50 years or so. Vanderbilt's fifth chancellor serving from 1963 to 1982, and you think about all the incredible changes that happened in this country between the early 60s and the early 80s. And while we're talking about the fifth chancellor, we also have the university's ninth chancellor, Chancellor Daniel Deermeyer here today, so a hand for Chancellor Deermeyer. Uh, and Chancellor Heard, you think about a man who was born while the Model T was still under production at Ford and was uh, living in, into the 2000s and all the changes that happened, anything you think about that happened in the 20th century, you know, he, he was there and a leader uh, during those times. Graduate of the University of North Carolina and Columbia University. 
uh, his wife, Jean, who we'll talk about today, and, and his children. Um, the Chancellor came from a very accomplished uh, intellectual family. Uh, his parents had gone to Vassar and to Lehigh. Uh, while well, the Chancellor was a student at the University of North Carolina, he was involved in bringing really interesting, at the time, controversial speakers to campus, you know, which has echoes in the 1960s and 70s when he was uh, the chancellor here, and you know, uh, making this a place where all ideas were heard, and this university was not afraid of hearing different perspectives. Uh, he had so many interesting roles, either in government or academia before he arrived here, uh, diplomacy, the State Department, you know, before he arrived at Vanderbilt, served in World War II in the Navy and was the author of several books uh, and a leading figure in uh, political science and studying politics in the South. Uh, you think about his term here at Vanderbilt, you know, stretching from the Kennedy administration to the Reagan administration, uh, from Chancellor Branscombe to Chancellor Wyatt, who was the chancellor while I was here. Uh, all the great changes that were happening on this campus, the first black undergraduates arriving here at Vanderbilt, the desegregation of, of the SEC, first woman on the board of trust, the Young Alumni Board of Trust position created. Title IX, uh, the fact that an equal number of women and men were admitted uh, to this university, which was something that I was not aware of until talking to this panel, that it used to be so split. Um, Vietnam, uh, incredible. It, I think it's just amazing that a class of alumni, whether from the late 60s or early 70s, thinking about how college campuses were in the late 60s and 70s, would choose to honor their chancellor. I mean, what an incredible presence he must have had at a time where you weren't supposed to trust anybody over the age of 30, right? And now here you are honoring uh, your chancellor when you get together 50 years later. Uh, the establishment of the, the Owen School, you know, acquisition of, of, of Blair and uh, the Peabody, this university growing in so many uh, amazing ways that we take for granted now. And then so many buildings that we're all familiar with on campus today were built during the chancellor's administration. So this college change, university changing in so many significant ways. So before we get to our guests, I wanted to share uh, five of my favorite quotes from the chancellor and having done the research for Strong Inside. Uh, chancellor Deermeyer was uh, mentioning earlier today that when he arrived here on campus, he read your father's book, which is a collection of his greatest speeches uh, at Vanderbilt, well, really all of his speeches, which were great, you know. Um, and so, you know, obviously one of the chancellor's hallmarks was his belief in the, in the open forum. Uh, and he tied that in many ways uh, to race. You know, in the ways that if Vanderbilt was gonna be a great school in the early 1960s when he arrived, this needed to be a place where black students were admitted and, and felt welcome on this campus. And he didn't shy away from topics that might have been considered controversial uh, in some quarters of the university. And so his very first speech when he's installed as chancellor, he says the most important issue in our country right now is this struggle for full freedom uh, for black people in the country. He set that tone right away. Um, he understood that a university is not separate from society, but a leader in this society, in its, in its city here in Nashville, and so many things needed to change in the city as well. Uh, I thought he was brilliant at the way that he would uh, preempt opposition, you know, and he would go uh, right into audiences that might not be the most open to what he had to say and explain his point of view. Uh, you see this in many of his early speeches here at Vanderbilt. Here, uh, this quote is when he's addressing the Rotary Club in downtown Nashville. You can think about the, the older uh, members of this club, probably uh, business leaders in this town, and he, he is warning them that there's about to be a bunch of speakers coming to Vanderbilt that they might not uh, agree with. And he's kind of saying, just to settle down. <laughs> you know, this is what a university is all about exchange of ideas is what it makes a university great and it's actually going to improve uh, this city in so many ways uh, the benefits of the open forum i felt like when he would talk about this he knew that not only was this going to create a more vibrant um, campus environment but that it was going to create graduates such as yourselves who were prepared to go out and be leaders in a country that was changing you know and that there are also benefits to the city of nashville as i mentioned um, a university needs to be relevant to the society it serves. And so how can you be a great university if, if the people coming out of that university haven't been prepared to entertain all sorts of ideas and to develop ideas of their own, not to be protected uh, or you know, restricted in what they're learning on a campus. Uh, this was a really special, um, it's not a quote from the chancellor, but it's a quote from Perry Wallace. And in getting to know many of you, I, I've heard over and over again how the chancellor made you feel when you were in his presence. You know, that he really 
took the time. He, he knew who you were, right? He looked in your eyes. Uh, he wasn't in a hurry to move on to the next person. And Perry really felt that. And so this quote that he gives here about, it, this was a, in the locker room at Memorial Gym after Perry's last game as a, as a sophomore. So it was his first year on the varsity, you know, where he has um, traveled to Mississippi State and to Ole Miss and to LSU, and he's encountered um, so many hostile, uh, threatening environments where he told me he thought that he might get shot and killed just for stepping on the basketball court. And he felt that so many people didn't really take the time to understand it. But when the chancellor came, made a point of coming into the locker room after the game, which was not something he did all the time, but he made his way over to Perry, you know, and he shook his hand, and he looked in his eyes, and he, he conveyed that he understood what Perry had been through. And when I interviewed Perry, that meant so much to him, you know, that personal interaction and understanding the significance of it. And then Chancellor Diermer, I thought you would appreciate this quote especially. Um, the chancellor recognized that for students who are only on campus for four years, if things don't happen in four years, it didn't happen. You know? And so the chancellor with a longer view of wanting to change this university might feel good about things that were set in motion but might not really come to fruition for five, 10, 15 years. And he talked about how, uh, I'll just read it, sometimes persons with a long view become impatient with others, sometimes students, a very gentle way of saying it, whose span is two or four years or six years. A chancellor soon learns that every step up the ladder simply raises the ground level. And the more rapid the steps, the faster the ladder extends into the sky. Uh, what a brilliant quote that I think our chancellor could relate to. And so that's what I wanted to say as we set up this uh, conversation with these three uh, incredible panelists. Uh, to my left is Connie Hurd, the daughter of the chancellor. She's, uh, yes, it's here. <laughs> She's a professor of violin and chair of the string department here at Vanderbilt's Blair School of Music, and she was the first tenured professor at the Blair School, quite an accomplishment there. She has served on the artist faculty and is co-director of the chamber music program at the Aspen Music Festival in school since 2005. Uh, she earned a master of music degree from the Juilliard School, as well as bachelor degrees from Juilliard and Sarah Lawrence College. Connie Hurd. <laughs> to her left, we have Nancy Oliver Gray, who went on from uh, you know, being on this campus in the presence of an amazing chancellor to become a university leader herself as president of Hollins College from 2005 to 2017. After serving in development and other leadership positions here at Vanderbilt, University of Louisville, Oberlin, Ryder, Princeton, and as president of Converse College. Uh, she's now a senior consultant to Gonzer Gerber Fundraising and Strategic Consulting. Nancy. And then if you live here in Nashville, uh, Pat Nolan here on the end is a familiar face that you see on TV discussing uh, politics quite a bit, but Pat is, has been senior vice president at DVL Sigenthaler, Finn Partners, public relations firm, outstanding firm here in Nashville, and a longtime host of Inside Politics and political commentator on Channel 5, and a 2016 inductee into the Vanderbilt Student Media Hall of Fame. Pat Nolan. Okay, so thinking back to, the, uh, to Perry's quote about how he felt in the chancellor's presence, I wanted to ask each of you, how did you feel in this man's presence? I'll come back to you, Connie, because you had a very different experience on that. Um, but let's start with you, Nancy. What, what did it feel like to be around Chancellor Hurd? He was disarmingly charming. He would look at us, make eye contact, and make you feel like you were the only person in the room and the only person who mattered to him. And then when you saw him the next time, and you would think he won't remember who I am, he would remember. Or at least he made us feel like. <laughs> he really did remember and knew us. He cared about us. How about you, Pat? Well, I'm, most people in this room that are members of our class met the Chancellor and Mrs. Hurd at the annual freshman picnic during freshman orientation, the first week we were on campus. I was not a freshman at Vanderbilt. I transferred to Vanderbilt after two years at Peabody. So that's not where I met him. I don't think I met him until either my junior or senior year. The chancellor used to have, a couple times a year, news conferences for the campus media. WRVU, where I worked, The Hustler, and in those days, Versus was still a newspaper, and they were there there too. And when I walked in, the chancellor called me 
not just Mr. Nolan, but by Pat. Well, you know, when the boss of the university calls you by your first name and you didn't even think he knew who the hell you were, <laughs> it, was, it was both, a, felt like a great honor, but it was also a little unnerving to do that. One other interesting thing about his uh, news conferences, and I never experienced this much at all when I was in the media for 50 years after that, in order to go there, if you had questions to ask for the chancellor, you had to submit those questions in writing in advance before it started. I didn't have too many people do that before, but I did have an opportunity right after I left the university to interview him when he didn't know he was going to have to be interviewed, so I didn't have to submit questions. The university at that time was expanding the campus as a part of the urban renewal program. It was before the Metro Council, and because I knew something about that plan, I had a chance to, to anchor the live coverage that was on the public television station, WDCN at that time, and it was on Channel 2, not Channel 8, where it is today as WNPT. The, the council decided to defer the bill and take out some property, which was not what Vanderbilt was expecting or hoping to have happen. Well, the, after the council did that, they decided to go out in the hall, take a recess, and talk about it, leaving me with lots of dead air time to fill. Well, Jan Belcher or somebody at Vanderbilt got the chancellor up, and I spoke to him to fill all that dead air time for a good bit, and as he always was. He looked right at you. You felt like you were the only person in the world he was talking to, and was very gracious in answering all the questions. So he was very good on his feet to talk to you even when he didn't know the answers or he didn't know the questions in advance of what was coming. So I always enjoyed being around him, although compared to the other two people up here, I know him less than anybody else maybe in the room. Okay, okay. Connie, you knew him the best of anyone in this room. Most of the people in the room here saw the chancellor when he was at work. You know, what was he like at home? What were the rituals and the routines in the herd house at 211 Deer Park Drive in Belmead? Well, I think he was the same person that, that you all uh, saw. Um, he was very much a family man. He, uh, when he met my mother, she, had, she was in recovery from a car accident where she had lost an ovary. It's maybe too much information, but uh, <laughs> so the doctors had said she may never have children, and so he married her knowing that she may never have children, and five years later there were four babies, so <laughs> he said she married me under false pretenses, <laughs> and when I had a child myself, I said, Popper, what was going on there? I said, four children in five years? And he said, well, if you're asking if it was an energetic, somewhat hectic time, yes, it certainly was. <laughs> but uh, but he, was, he spent a great deal of time with the family. I remember in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, where we lived before Nashville, uh, somebody asked him how long it took to mow the lawn. And he said an hour, and he said, or if the children help me, it takes two. <laughs> but um, uh, in Nashville, we, we moved in 63, of course, and uh, we did have a ritual. He, he got home, compared to today's schedules, it's really interesting to think that things were so regular, but when he was in town, he got home really at 5.30 every afternoon from Kirkland Hall, and uh, I would look out the window, and when he drove up, I would go hide behind the front door, and as he walked up, I would open the door, and then a little while later, the alarm would be sounded, it's time for, for happy hour. And uh, all six of us would gather, um, you know, maybe some of us were doing homework or that kind of thing, and we would come down to the library at 211 Deer Park Drive, which I think most of you probably were in that house. Um, and we would have, the kids would have kitty drinks, and my parents would have cocktails, and we would sit and talk for 45 minutes or an hour, and that was, that was every single night. And that was just, that wasn't, gee, we've got soccer games, we've got this, we've got that. It, that's just the way it was every day. Um, and uh, he, you know, <clears throat> when it was snowing and when it, when it was really cold outside, we would go sledding down the hill. We would go ice skating on Richland Creek if it was frozen. Um, he was adventuresome, which <clears throat> I, I think was apparent in <clears throat> the way he uh, interacted with all of you and, and at the university. Um, uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Okay. He, al always an ad adventurer. And one thing you mentioned to me when we talked uh, for the book was, in my house, my kids know if the mom is talking to them, they're in trouble. And they're like, I can be the softy, right? How, how was it in, in your house? <clears throat> well, it was interesting. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, if something went awry and my mother would say, we are going to talk to your father about this tonight. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, that's not going to be as bad as this. <laughs> 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 but, 
but he was, you know, he was the highest standards, and you certainly didn't want to cross him. Mm -hmm. And I think as the only girl and the youngest, I, uh, we really didn't cross much. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing you mentioned, he got home at 5.30, but he started his days very early yes. in your house, right, before he drove into yes. his job. He, he, would, he would get up at 4.30, and that was his golden time to work between, uninterrupted, between 4.30 and 6.30. And then the rest of the day, he was, you know, he, he was uh, with people. And uh, one of his, I, I don't remember if it was Rob Roy Purdy, if it was Bob McGaw, but one of them found out that they could reach him at that time. Uh -oh. <laughs> and he was like, oh, my, the deuce. Oh, it is, you know, <laughs> here is my special time, the only time all day I can work uninterrupted. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, he, he, um, he worked a great deal, and he never showed any signs of s stress. He never, it was never, I'm so busy, I, never. Just, wow. you know. Nancy, we talked about how he was laying the groundwork for change to happen while he was chancellor. And then, you know, and encouraging this open forum. But he wasn't just talking about things, like the changes actually happened. You know, in your mind, what were the most significant changes that were occurring while you were a student here? And how did he make it happen? You know, he really walked the talk. You looked at, many of you have his commencement address to us from 1973, in which he laid out principles that he lived by. And in his leadership, he exemplified those principles. Principles like every person matters. And so he was intentional, strategic, and serious about building a campus community, facilitating a community that welcomed people of all colors, and all physical abilities. He was intentional about advancing women. He personally recruited Mary Jane Wortham, the first woman um, to serve on the Board of Trust. One of my favorite stories was when I was working here after graduation as Director of Corporate Relations. I had the privilege of setting up and arranging calls on Corporate Contributions Committees. And sometimes I would travel with the chancellor and we would make presentations to this group on behalf of the university. And one trip, we went to Pittsburgh. And after arriving, and I was seven months pregnant, so here I'm very pregnant with the chancellor arrived at the Duquesne Club. The Duquesne Club did not admit women. So Chancellor Hurd and I walked up to the front door, took one look at me and said, you may come in, sir. You go to the back and come in the kitchen entrance to me. <laughs> Chancellor Hurd said, thank you very much. Can you tell me where the kitchen entrance is? Mm. And he accompanied me through the kitchen into the private dining room with the Gulf Oil Contributions Committee. That's walking the talk. <laughs> Another memory is his commitment to the open exchange of ideas. Many of you probably remember um, the invasion of Cambodia or the anticipated invasion. He called us together, having just been appointed to President Nixon's Presidential Advisory Committee, and said, give me a chance. He talked to us, he sought out our opinions, he listened to us, but he also acted in thoughtful, strategic, appropriate ways. Boy, do we need him right now. Mm -hmm. With that kind of commitment to open exchange of ideas, treatment, and honoring each person and what each person has to bring and finding ways to exchange ideas, listen to each other in a civil and respected manner. Wow, they're an amazing person. And obviously, I mean, having that sort of influence on this campus at that time in history, he was highly sought after. And there are many other universities that were trying to pull him away from Vanderbilt. I think the closest he ever came was probably Columbia University. Pat, what do you remember about that time? Well, I was not in Nashville that summer. I, I missed all that and didn't know until I was working on one of these reunions how close he came to becoming the president of Columbia University. Everybody in Nashville thought that he was going that way. If you read, go back and read the newspapers, you'll find that. 
he and his family went over to, uh, I think, South Carolina for about a month to contemplate what to do. This was in the summer. And about two weeks before this class came to Vanderbilt, he announced he was staying at Vanderbilt. Now, this was right after all the period that was controversy about him bringing Stokely Car uh, the university bringing Stokely Carmichael, Martin Luther King, and later when we were here, William Kunstler to speak at the, at the Impact Forum. But there was actually jubilation in Nashville. Tennessee wrote a very glowing editorial about him staying. There was even an editorial cartoon of the, of the, of the statue of the Commodore out in front of Kirkland Hall celebrating that the, that the, the <laughs> Chancellor Heard was staying. I think it was very interesting that perhaps some of us didn't realize that when you go to the, the, the chancellor's picnic, the chancellor might not have been there that year, because it, it just would have been right after that happened. Um, so there was also a thank you reception held in early September that year. The Tennessean reports that there were 3,500 people that showed up for this reception. It was held at what was then the brand new university club. They had to extend the reception an extra hour so people could go through and get through the receiving line to shake his hand, shake Mrs. Hurd's hand, the board of trust chair, and probably others that were in the line. That's extraordinary because he had come through probably the most controversial part of his career at Vanderbilt to do that, particularly from one of the publishers at Nashville because Jimmy Stallman was the owner and publisher of the, of the banner and he was not a fan of the people they were bringing to town mm -hmm. to do that. In fact, there was such confusion in the community that when they brought Stokely Carmichael here, it was at the same time they opened the first Carmichael Towers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and people in town thought it was being named for Stokely. <laughs> what furthered the confusion was, they also put a picture of the first towers on the cover of the phone book. And those years, that phone book was put out every year, and if you, were on, if you had something on the front page, it was high, high visibility. So, he, but he managed to weather all that, even including the governor of the state in 1970, when we were freshmen in the impact, they brought Kunstler in here, and the governor blocked him coming to UT. Okay. But he did come and speak here. Mm -hmm. And Connie, just in, within your family, did you feel like you were moving to New York? Was it how close did it come? What did you remember about that? Um, uh, it was just an interesting time. Uh, they, he, you know, he had gotten his doctorate there. He felt a real kinship with Columbia, um, and he was approached by many schools. And I think that was really the one he if it was going to be any school, it was going to be Columbia. Um, and I don't remember strong feelings of my own about, oh gosh, it'd be great to move to New York, or gee, I don't want to leave. I probably would have leaned more towards the latter. Mm -hmm. But um, I do know they went up, they looked at the president's house. Um, it, it was very serious consideration. Um, and uh, and, and it's, it's, it's such a different time now. It was in the news, it was in the news a lot. I don't mm -hmm. think that would be the case now. But uh, I, I think it was very close. I think he felt that he could um, make more of a contribution here. That was my impression, was that in the end, he thought this was where he could have the impact. Mm -hmm. And so Nancy, you knew him uh, while you were a student here, but then you went to work at Vanderbilt afterwards. You become a university president later in your life. What lessons did you learn from the way that he operated that you took with you into your uh, career as a university administrator? I truly used to sometimes think, what would Chancellor Hurd do? <laughs> and one of the things I learned here was conflict and exchange of ideas is part of the essential nature of a university community. We are, in a university, supposed to stretch to learn, and you do that by exchanging ideas, hearing from somebody who thinks differently than you. Conflict is never easy. And so I learned when there was conflict, when there were difficult situations, to walk into it, not away from it. To try to listen to people, to ask questions, to hold my own tongue until I understood how other people were thinking, whether they were students, faculty, or trustees. Similarly, the commitment to the open exchange of ideas having speakers come to the campus, um, regardless of what controversy they may have stirred up, whether in this environment, conservative or liberal. But to be certain that we did that as an educational experience, sometimes giving space for the other side to respond, sometimes doing education prior or after, uh, prior to or after a speaker came, that I directly learned. 
but I also learned how important relationships are. How many of us have been to the chancellor's house? Probably all of us. You know, we all did that freshman picnic and then we came again. Many of us would receive invitations to go to a lunch as a student or later or with a group. I just heard about him attending a commencement brunch after commencement our senior year. He went, he, he built relationships with us. We mattered. And when you have those relationships, there's a foundation of trust that makes leadership, especially change leadership, more possible. Can I ask you a quick question? You mentioned about going to eat with the chancellor. And there's a story circulating, I don't know if it's true or not, that says a little bit about his relationship with students, but also the type of, uh, a little bit of Arist Aristotic man that he was. I love this story. And if this is not a true story, forgive me, it's still a good one. <laughs> I've heard about a group of students who invited the chancellor to go to lunch with him. And many students would invite him to come to their parties, their brunch, and if he could, he often accepted bringing Jean with him. And this group of students decided to take the chancellor to that new restaurant across the street called McDonald's. <laughs> they walked into McDonald's, and Chancellor Hurd sat down, waiting to be served. <laughs> How does that story hit you, Connie? Does that sound like your dad? <laughs> I, 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 would, I would think that he would size up the situation and see the line. <laughs> <laughs> Nancy mentioned your mom. And before we, we're going to open this up, I know so many people in the audience have stories they would like to share or questions they would like to ask. But can you tell us a little bit more about your mom? And I know she was an accomplished musician herself and involved with founding the Nashville Symphony. Um, what was the role of, of music in your house? And, and how did your mom figure into that? Well, my mother was a professional violinist, as am I. In fact, I play her violin. Um, oh, oh, sorry. Um, uh, my mother was a professional violinist, and uh, I play her violin. Um, you still play her violin? I still play her violin. It's a very, very old violin. <laughs> but, uh, um, and she played with the North Carolina String Quartet uh, for years, you know, until they moved to Nashville. And she was, she was a passionate woman, those of you who knew her knew that, and, and she was very passionate about music. And she, um, she was not involved with founding the symphony, but she, she played in the symphony, and then she was uh, on the board and various search committees, so she was very involved with it. Um, and she played recitals, and she did recording sessions, uh, you know, back up Nashville recording sessions for a long time. And then eventually the, the duties of wife of the chancellor sort of took over, and I. I asked uh, my father at one point, I said, what would have happened if, you know, mommy had said she wouldn't do that? And he mm. said, well, that would have been okay. And he said things would have been much more institutional. They wouldn't have been quite as personal, um, but, but we would have managed that fine. Um, but uh, my father loved jazz and he loved jazz singers and would listen. He had all kinds of cassettes in the car, uh, but he was not a musician. Um, I think that we can, probably credit my mother and director of the Blair Academy of Music, Del Sawyer, for seeing to it that the chancellor um, had a music school join Vanderbilt. <laughs> right. um, she was very passionate about that. She was like, no self-respecting university cannot have a music school. Uh -huh. But uh, so, so music, uh, all of my siblings played for a while. I was the one it stuck with. Um, but music was a, had a huge role. and. Uh, and when I moved back to, to town in 82 to, to join the Blair String Quartet and the Vanderbilt faculty, uh, my parents came to every single concert I ever played from, from then on. Wonderful. Yeah. 